an Alberta house, Metaxon, and uh, I was born in the town of Hobart. Does she sound okay? Um, yeah, just, um, Does you're kind of soft-spoken. <coughs> so Is her arm covering the mic? No. No. So. Okay. Actually, I can raise that up about an inch, too. You won't let's be in the Let's do that. Shot. Yeah, let's do that. There you okay. go. Okay. Do we need to start over? Are we going? No. No, we're oh. good. Okay. Anytime. Can you tell me about your parents, Alberta? And your grandparents, their well, names, and where they were born? Well, my grandfather, I never knew. His name was Fred Bennett, but I understand he was uh, from Pennsylvania, known as uh, Pennsylvania Dutch, which is really German. And um, he died when my mother was like 15 years old. My grandmother was Lydia Bennett, uh, formerly Dockstater. And um, she was quite well known in the community. She was a very caring person, very strict, but very caring. And um, I learned a lot from her. And, and then my mother, Prudence Bennett House Dockstater, worked at the grocery stores here in Oneida. And um, she worked long hours, a lot of days, and so we were left with my grandmother a lot. And of course every summer we got taken to Door County for cherry picking, which um, was, when I think back, okay, we learned a lot there and how to get along with other people and, and uh, how to work, really. And, but we always looked forward to when my mother would come up for a few days because then we could go swimming or take a half a day off once in a while anyway. <laughs> so, and my dad was George House, and um, he eventually had his own business, and he has passed away. He left us about two years ago, and um, he was very hardworking. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand his way of doing things sometimes and uh, but he was he never asked you to do anything that he wouldn't do himself as far as work so uh, I think on both sides of my family they were all real hard working and where was your where was your father born uh, my father was born here and he had two brothers and four sisters and um, his mother passed away well I think it was in the in the 50s not too long after I was married and, um, and she was a very hard-working person and uh, just very much a lady um, she liked to dress up and go shopping and stuff like that. So I really, um, she used to take us sh shopping with them every Saturday. That was a real big deal because of course there was no buses here. So we got to go to Green Bay every Saturday with she and my two aunts. And um, so that was a really big deal for us. We looked forward to it every Saturday. You remember the names of your grandparents? Um, my grandmother on my dad's side was uh, Cornelia Hose, and I think I mentioned Lydia Bennett. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather on my dad's side, I never knew. And I really didn't know, never heard much about him at all. So I'm really kind of out in left field on that one because I, I never. I guess I never really inquired because his name never just never really seemed to come up. Can you tell me a little bit about where you went to school and well, I started your education. Okay, I started at the uh, kindergarten at the parish hall here, 
And then from there I went to St. Joseph's Catholic School and went there until I was in eighth grade. And they decided that because we were non-Catholic, we couldn't go there anymore. So I came back to um, the eighth grade here at the parish hall. And um, then I went to Green Bay East High, where I graduated from. And um, then from here, I went to Milwaukee. And I sort of got the rest of my education on the job training. Can you tell me a little bit about your family, your, your marriage, when you were married, and your husband? I married Gerald Metaxon on November 55. And um, we had two daughters and two sons. We did lose our oldest daughter January 1979 through complications of diabetes. And um, I presently, our oldest son is married with six children. And the girl is next, Denise, and she has two daughters. And then our youngest son is uh, Tony, and next year he'll be getting married. So. Did you uh, work any time? And if you did, where did you work? I started out working in Milwaukee at a uh, it was sort of a magazine company where you filled orders like for uh, newsstands, uh, grocery stores, etc. Um, until, oh, I just worked there for a few months. And uh, because I wasn't quite 18, I was limited to, as, to where I could work. Eventually, I worked with Phoenix Hosiery and uh, I learned how to file and uh, type and all that from a lady there and worked with her for quite a while. Then from there I went to a law office and I worked there until 58 and um, finally I ended up with the working for the government uh, Treasury Department, IRS, and um, I just retired December 21 after 26 years with them. So, can we back up a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit about your growing up years? Were you involved in any kind of sports or? Anything like that? When I was growing up here, I was a ball player. I was a pitcher. I uh, played ball with through the church here. And um, I played ball with Ruth, Alice, Scanador, Ramona Zagadon, who is now a nun. And... Um, Noni Ninham, I believe. Uh, Marilyn Doxter. There was quite a few of them. Eventually, uh, we more or less went to Garcel's Bar and uh, had a team there. And we got more involved regional-wise and um, were, played ball with... Uh, quite a few of the girls from up the other end, so to speak, <laughs> Chicago Corners. <laughs> and um, after I left um, Oneida and moved to Milwaukee, I also played there with the uh, Milwaukee Bravettes, which were mostly Indian girls. And uh, I played ball till I got married and wished afterwards I would have never quit. <laughs> keeps you skinny <laughs> and um, but we, I had I had more fun made more friends playing ball I mean we just always had a lot of fun and um, 
Frank Bear was one of our coaches. Um, LeBoy Beard helped out at times. And Carl Skinner used to always be around to help. So we just, I mean, we just had a ball. Was that when you were in Milwaukee? Right, mm-hmm. So, but we, we did pretty good. <laughs> Is there anybody in the, um your uh, family background that's been involved in tribal politics or in the government, the United States government at all? The only one that I know of would be my Uncle Bob, Robert Bennett, and um, I tried to follow his career and he, he was in uh, the veterans programs and uh, a lot of the Indian organizations, including um, some in Alaska. He lived in Alaska for a while. I remember him living in South Dakota and coming home like once a year. And, and, uh, but he always, always let my mother know where he was. And uh, then he was in Washington, D.C. when he was commissioner. And so I, I think we've all been so proud of him. And, uh, you know, if you read about him or something, it sort of gives you uh, an incentive. I mean, if he could do it, you know, we can do it. And which, um, although you still I think you still have to have your family back, and especially if you're married or have children, because everybody has to stick together and and help you. But um, he's the only one is, that I know of. So. Was he ever involved in the tribal government here? I don't know that he was directly involved. I believe at certain times. Um, different ones would call him and ask him for his comments or or different things like that and um, but I don't think he I'm not sure that he sat on any board or anything like that I know he did uh, through Haskell in Kansas um, and he was involved in a lot of other Native American boards uh, where he could maybe get some financial help for kids who maybe went to Haskell but maybe didn't have anything else and the families couldn't help them financially. And I think he did some of that because I know when my daughter went out there, um, she got some money to... Um, for spending and stuff, which unfortunately we, she came home and we returned, but uh, he, I know he sat on boards like that to help. And I believe in uh, Albuquerque, he was um, on the university board for Native Americans to um, further their education and and help them get started. So. You mentioned that he was a commissioner. Do you know what he was a commissioner of? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. And I really don't know too much about that other than he was commissioner. I, I, know, I just know he worked with a lot of the Indian tribes. Do you know how long he was a commissioner of Indian Affairs? I'd say like eight to ten eight years at least. I um, I never really ke kept track, I guess mainly because I was more involved with my family. You mentioned that um, earlier when you were playing ball in the night of it, you played with um, girls from, from, against girls from right. the other end. Can you explain what the other end is? <laughs> well, to us, to us and to the girls from the other end, we were Oneida 
and they were Chicago Corners, and and uh, I think there was a, a little rivalry there, like um, like Oneida and Christina, <laughs> you know. But um, we, when I went to Garrisons, and we, there were some of us from, I guess the Oneida proper, and then from what is what is Westy Pier, I guess. Uh, but um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Just can you um, remember any of the holidays that you that you had and uh, how you spent those holidays? Christmas, um, we always came to midnight mass, and my mom and dad were divorced and well separated at the time that uh, to begin with. Then we were um, allowed to go to my dad's home by my grandma, my grandma house, we always called her. And um, it was kind of a ritual. They would have a big kettle of oyster stew and stuff like that with uh, Cornelius's, her, her side of the family, Leo Cornelius and um, Billy and all of them, they were more or less single at the time. And um, then after that, we they take us home. The next day I spent with my mom and my grandma. And then in the afternoon, if we wanted to, we could go by friends or back to my grandma's. Easter, I remember um, having to get up like, Three thirty, four o'clock, going with my grandma Bennett to a spring near the um, Lutheran Cemetery. And she would get bottles of water, spring water, and from there we'd walk to church and then she would bring that water so it would be blessed at Mass at 6 uh, six o'clock in the morning and then after service then we um, would either go home and look for our baskets or we would go to my grandma houses again so I was never really kept away from my dad's side of the family like some kids are today uh, my mom was I think above and beyond because whenever my dad wanted us, we were al allowed to go with him unless there was something involved with school or church or something like that. Then she might say, you know, the kids are have this or that to do. But we were always um, able to go see our dad at just about any given time, which um, I think would be a good lesson for a lot of young people today because they, as far as I can see, a lot of them use the children as pawns. But she never was that way. And um, so we spent a lot of time between my mom and my dad's family. You mentioned that your grandmother got water at the, at the spring and brought it to the church to be blessed. Would you tell us what the water was used for? Well, some she gave to her friends holy water, and they would use it at home. And um, like if somebody got sick or sprinkling of water or, or just every day, if you say your prayers, you use it when you would make the sign of the cross or whatever. And um, or if she knew someone was ill, she would take them a little bottle of holy water. So, and always have it there in, in case our pastor would have to come say prayers for him or anything like that. And also, she would just give it to the church. Okay, can you remember if your grandmother on either side uh, used herbs, and if they did, what kind they did use and what they used it for? I don't know that my grandma hosted, but my grandma Bennett used to chew on something when she'd get a sore throat. I never knew what it was. 
they also had an organization whereby they would meet oh, periodically. I never learned what it was. Uh, and I don't know of anybody that does it today. But I remember we always had to buy peanuts in the shell. She'd always have those and they always use some ashes from the stove and what they did at these meetings I don't know but because she would never tell us and uh, it as far as I know it never carried on to any you know the younger people so if it was a healing service of sorts or what it was I, I have no idea and I guess I never thought to ask my mother either after I left here, but I, we used to <laughs> we used to be upstairs and sometimes you know we'd try to look down through the register to see and you'd hear them talking, but always in Indian of course, and that and then the next day we were just glad because they didn't eat all the peanuts <laughs> but I have and I and she would never. I was told there was a name for this organization, but I never knew what it was. And um, it was mostly the elderly. I never knew any, I never remember seeing any younger person or even middle-aged person at all seemed to be at the time my grandma's age, which would have been like in late 60s, early, she was in 60s, early 70s, you know, so. Were the members of this organization all tribal members? Right. Yes, they were all, all Indian, and they were couples, and um, and well, some were widows, and but uh, they, there'd be like maybe ten, twelve of them, you know, and we always got sent upstairs when it was about time for them to start. <laughs> or to come to the house because it was always at at our house or or you know or she went to somebody else's house but I have no idea and and um, for a long time I was curious and we used to ask her and she she just would never tell us could you um, give us the names of your aunts and uncles on your on your father's side of the family um, his brothers would James House, Jimmy, Warren House. He had a sister, Margaret Arndt, who lived in Surrey most of the time I can remember. Pansy House, I I knew who she was, and that was about it. She, As far as I knew, she always lived in Detroit. And, of course, my Aunt Vera, Vera Perkins, who today is in the nursing home, and my Aunt Catherine, Kate, and um, she lives with her daughter now, and those were the only ones of my dad's, and my mother just had the one brother, Robert Bennett. You mentioned that your grandmother was a Cornelius. Do you know anything about uh, her, her family? Um, not really. I knew she had a sister whose name was Jalos, and she lived uh, way up north, I think around Three Lakes or someplace like that. I never, as far as I knew, she was a widow, you know, and she lived up there, and I never, never got to visit her up there, but she used to come down to visit my grandma maybe once a year. My Aunt Lavinia was another sister of hers, and uh, she was one of the first uh, nurses, I believe, from around here. And when I knew her, she was like already retired. And I remember being hurt at school and when I was in kindergarten, and apparently not apparently, but I did get a 
pulled by the legs off a swing and then my knee would never heal so she told my mom you let her stay with me and I'll fix it and that was some stay <laughs> I had to help I had to help her with dishes and I remember that water used to be scalding hot but she believed in in um, boiling your water and oh my gosh the steam would just be coming up but I would have to help her and she took care of me like I, I guess almost a year and I stayed with her she was very very strict <laughs> but in her own way she was very good to you she would take us to Green Bay take us to the Y because they had showers there because of course we didn't have any running water and um, she, so she would take us there for our, our weekly shower or bath and then she would take us downstairs and um, let us pick from the buffet or at the time at the Y and uh, we could have a treat but she always kept you dressed nice and and she really took care of you and but in her own way and uh, I guess the only time I didn't really care to go with her was when the Y would be serving tongue <laughs> and she would make you eat it <laughs> but um, she was she was very um, hard-working person and she was very committed to the church so those are the only ones I knew um, outside of the cousins Leo and Billy Cornelius and their mom um, but otherwise I didn't know where like where they were from or or if they were born here or anything like that so there's a lot to lot to learn on my both sides I guess did your mother and father ever speak about uh, their education when they were young did they tell you anything about if they went to school somewhere or anything like that my mother went to um, I think she said Flandreau or Pipestone and my dad only went as far as third grade and um, education was a big thing I think a bigger thing with him than any other person in my family because I can remember being offered a job when I was uh, beginning senior in high school and it was good money because it was at one of the meat companies and um, I, I asked my mom if I could quit and take this job and um, she said check with your dad if he says it's okay then you can but I think you should get your diploma so that weekend I went to my dad's to stay for the weekend and uh, after a day of just about doing everything else I finally said dad and he said no <laughs> I didn't even get the question out of my mouth and he said no and I said I didn't even ask you yet and he said whatever it is no and uh, so then I asked my mom I said did you call him and tell him she said no I didn't so whether or not she did I I don't know but I'm I, I've been very grateful that he did say no because uh, one of the one of the girls I went to school with did quit and uh, she worked there and I learned later that she had trouble with her hands and stuff like that from working in the cold all the time so it it was um, it was because of my dad that I kept on with getting my diploma and I think where I ended up today Okay. Alberta, um, you don't men didn't mention anything about uh, speaking the Oneida language. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I never learned the language. Basically, I guess because my grandma never really taught us, and 
And uh, she used to always say, well, how can I talk about you if, you know, if I teach you that? But I think it had to do with a lo with her not being able to use it or my mom. My mom understands um, some, but she doesn't speak it. I did learn some words, uh, and I wouldn't know if I remembered them now, when I was working at Morgan's store, because Grandma Chris John used to come in there, and she, of course, didn't speak English, and um, I would wait on her, and after a while you kind of get to know what she's asking for. And so I learned a few words there. My dad spoke the language, but of course I was never around him daily or anything like that to learn. And um, I believe his whole side of the family speaks the language. And, um, but my, my mom and my grandma never spoke it to us. Uh, I would have liked to have learned it, but never really got the chance until just, well, a few years ago in Milwaukee, but then that, uh, I never went there either because I was involved with other things, so it would be nice for the kids to learn. I was hoping maybe one of my grandkids would learn, but they're involved in other things and none of them are married to Indians. And um, now one family moved up to Westfield, so they'll probably never come in contact with it. But I think it's great that they're learning here. Okay, um, getting back to your childhood again, um, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences when you were cherry picking? Well, I had to go cherry picking every summer with my grandma. I think from the time I was three, four years old. And of course we had we had to pick, we had to get up early um, because my grandma was, oh, she was sort of a manager or, and she would get people here to um, go and they would come and pick us up in a big old truck and uh, take us there and we stayed in cabins and um, our, my grandma stayed in the main one, and um, she was a real hard worker. As we got older, we would have to pick so many pails a day, and I think my last limit was like 20 a day. But she would get up like 4.30, 5 o'clock, and on a wood stove, make breakfast for all those that boarded with her. They would each pay so much a week and uh, they would, uh, the actual cabins were free but to board with her meant getting three squares a day and they did. <laughs> Everything from breakfast, and I mean she would make homemade pies, she would bake bread, all in a wood stove. She would make lunch for them and take it out there sometimes and uh, we would have our social time after 4.30, 5 o'clock and then maybe 6.30, 7 all those that boarded with her would come to eat and I mean even some of these young guys that you know really thought they were something around here man they just they just couldn't wait you know, and, and bored with her because she really cooked. <laughs> she, she really cooked. And, uh, but she also expected you to toe the line. And, um, and then she'd ask the owners, like, to take us out on um, Sunday afternoons in the truck, maybe to um, Door County Park or someplace like that, or and they would 
get ball games together with other cherry orchards and um, have some pretty good competition. And um, we just, it was like one big family, really. And uh, of course, my sister and I always had to help her with setting the table. And we had metal plates. Um, and these blue, what are they called? Enamel. 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 Yeah, blue enamel plates and uh, cups and that, which of some I still have. And uh, she had, she knew just what belonged to her. And, and then sometimes she would even help other people who were cooking, you know, because maybe they weren't acquainted on how to cook on a wood stove or when to start this or that. But at the time there were no TV dinners. <laughs> And it wasn't just sandwiches we had. I mean, we had fried chicken, we had roasts, we had soup, we had everything, cookies, she'd make cakes. And, you know, it was just just like being home. And I think in some cases, I think it was better than being home for some of them. So it, uh, we, we had to work hard, but then we got to play hard sometimes, so. How many um, people were usually in your camp? Oh, there could be anywhere from 30 up 50. Do you know how many years your grandmother did that? Let's see, I was probably through the 50s because I quit when I was 14, I think. And I don't think she went much beyond that. And, um, but she had charge of a couple different camps. And um, then, of course, they went to modernization and machines. So it kind of took away from the people going. You mentioned your sister being there also. Could you? Tell us how many uh, sisters and brothers you have and what their names are. I have one sister, Diane Thiessen. She's two years younger than I am. And I have a brother, Kenny. We always called him Hoyan because he was born on New Year's Day. He lives out east someplace and we really don't have much contact with him. Um, to his someday regret. But it's that's another story. <laughs> I have no idea where he. All I know is he lives in Connecticut. We've. Um, I used to write to him and that, and and uh, he just kind of quit uh, writing to us or calling us. So I have no idea where where he lives now. Uh, you mentioned Hoyan. Is there another connection with? With Hoyan, is there another meaning to Hoyan for you? Happy New Year. Did you do anything and special on that day? Oh yeah. <laughs> we went Hoyaning um, through the neighborhood, friends. It's sort of like today's trick or treating, without any tricks. <laughs> they would mostly give us donuts, homemade donuts or sometimes fruit or nuts or something like that. And then we would take our all our goodies home. And um, I tried that in Milwaukee a few times, but nobody would ever show up. <laughs> I, I would make donuts and I'd tell all my Indian friends, you know, but the only one that ever showed up was one of my white friends. <laughs> And she'd always come over, and, and uh, so then I, I kind of quit. But now, the um, Seat's office in, in Milwaukee, in just invites you over for donuts and coffee on New Year's Day, I believe. But, you know, to be able to go to somebody's house to do it, 
you know, I thought I tried, but like I say, they, nobody ever came around, so. Did you go also to uh, non-tribal uh, homes as well when you were Hoyani? Not that I remember. I, I don't, I don't think I did. I think it was mostly family and, um, oh, and friends on South Pork Avenue. <laughs> and, uh, because, well, we were just allowed to go so far and that was it. But basically all our friends lived right around there anyway, so. You mentioned South Park Avenue. Is that uh, the name of the street? Or did you live there at one time? I lived there at one time. How it got the name, I don't know. And um, but it's not known by that now. I don't believe. But it. Uh, why I don't. I guess I never really checked into. I think I asked one person, and they didn't know why it was called South Park Avenue. And, uh, but the street is still there. <laughs> but not South Park Avenue. No. <laughs> Alberta, um, if you were, wanted to leave something with all of the young people today, uh, recommendations or anything, what would you say to these young people today? Well, I think it would have to be with family. Um, I, I don't say my kids are perfect, or I was, or any of my friends, but I see so many young girls having babies. I see so many couples having babies, and then splitting or divorcing where these kids are used as pawns and I just feel really bad. Uh, why? I don't know. Um, because it's, these young people need, need mother and father and I believe they all know what they're getting themselves into. And so, and there's so many ways of protection. There's so many ways of of uh, not getting pregnant and things like that. And to bring these kids in and just have them not be able to see their dad, or not be able to see their mother, or not be able to share a holiday with each of them and I think that is so wrong and I think it really messes up a child and I see it in on my own side of the family and I and I think it makes a, for a lot of problems so I would like to see the young people more educated about family. It's not just being married. I think it's finances and how you work together are, you know, well, I think ERA had a lot to do with our young women. I think I went through a lot being married at the beginning. I think it's paid off. Um, I, some of the girls nowadays, they don't like this, they don't like that, or, or the guys want to do their own thing. And um, I still think marriage is the way to go, but I think you really have to work twice as hard at it today because of the kids. And I think the kids really need the mother and father because of the way our our life is, our lifestyle is. They need all the 
all the education they can get, they need all the backing they can get, they need all the support they can get, and they need to be brought into a family where they they won't just give themselves away, you know. They'll they'll have goals and uh, and good goals. And I think uh, going to church, my my two, the girl and the older boy, Denise and Keith, they're involved in church. My son Tony is not right now, but he is leaning towards it. And I think uh, that helps too. Is there anything else you'd uh, like to tell us that we might have missed? Um, maybe in regards to uh, your grandparents or, or your parents? Well, I think uh, as far as my grandparents, uh, they both, they all, well, the grandmas both lived, I think, nice lives the way they got. My grandma Bennett, she was always uh, always working for somebody else, always doing for somebody else. Um, my dad's mother, I think the, the children there, kind of protected her and she uh, they did everything they could to make her life happy and gave her things. Um, my grandma Bennett worked for the church. She always was helping somebody. She was always cooking for somebody or cleaning and I know that because we'd have to go along and um, and my mom is the same way. I mean, I go down by my mom's, you know, and and I see the stuff she has, and I'll say, Mom, you don't need this, you know. Well, I might have to give this at the church, or I might make this, you know, and I don't, then I don't have to worry about getting this pan back or that pan, you know. And uh, we've moved her like three times, and each time we we get rid of things, and each time it builds up again because she's, making this or baking that and and uh, always worried about the next one and or her neighbors and and uh, she lives in the um, elderly complex at site one and uh, I can remember going there one day and she was so tired and I, I said uh, why are you so tired and she said well she had started to um, cut the grass on her hands and knees between the sidewalk and the building. Well, one lady saw that and she says, Oh, Prudy, can you do mine? I'm always so afraid of snakes. So she did that for her. She ended up doing the whole, around the whole building. And I said, that's why they have these young guys. They're supposed to do that. And she said, yeah, I know. And uh, so I kind of put a stop to that because she was like already well into her 70s mm -hmm. and so she's always even now she's going to Thanksgiving at the parish hall but she's going to cook a turkey at home just in case she has company <laughs> she's every Sunday she cooks a meal and she's done that as long as I can remember Every Sunday she'll cook a meal, whether we're invited out or not, so that there's always something for home. But I think the biggest sacrifice that I can remember, um, well, maybe it wasn't a sacrifice on her part, but I always thought it was getting up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to meet one of the truck drivers by the railroad tracks or beavers around there giving him money, meeting him back in the afternoon with a box of cream puffs for us. I mean, this, you know, this was like in the late 40s, early 50s, and she would, on her day off, get up and do that. 
so that we would have something different for a dessert. And I always thought, oh, you know, get up that early and then go down there. But she'd do that like once a week for a certain period of time and then we'd have our cream puffs. And I thought, oh, wow. But she always does. She's always cooking. And I just, when I would invite her to Milwaukee, uh, like Thanksgiving and different days like that, when my kids were younger, she would come down there and right down the basement she'd go and do a load of laundry for me or something, you know. Finally I told her that was off limits. <laughs> or she'd help me with dinner, but, or she'd say, Gerald, what would you like? You know, while I'm here, can I fix it? And, um, and I used to tease her, and I'd say, how come you always ask him? I'm the daughter, you know. <laughs> but she just loves to cook, and so I don't argue with her anymore. I figure at 87, and she can still cook a meal, let her cook. Because that was, it just, I don't know, it just makes her happy, I guess, and to still be able to do it. And so every week, Gerald and I, now that we live up here, go to her house or I invite her over and and she still wants to be cooking. So it's just, you know, I'm, I guess I'm just really glad she's able to. As much as she didn't want us to move up here because our, of our family in Milwaukee, I think she's glad that we, we are here because now I can take her for a ride here or there or do things with her now that she's retired. <laughs> so. Where did your mother retire from? Well, my mother's retired, uh, she retired once from Schrader's store, and now she retired from the library. So, and she's. What library was that, and how long did she work there? Oh, gosh. I think she said she worked at the Oneida Library for 12 years. And um, I think she would still be working if I didn't move up here. But I, I sort of said, you know, Mom, maybe you should give it up and just uh, so we can do things. I said, now I'm up here. I can take you here, take you there. Because she has, has gotten hurt a couple times now. And, um, but she always bounces back. <laughs> so, what year did she retire uh, from she, the library? Uh, just this past uh, September. So she worked the, up until right, right. So, and um, I, I'm really glad she. I I said to her, you know, if you work things right, they might have you back on forty hours when you hit ninety, <laughs> if you don't retire pretty soon. Because she started out there with working only eight hours, you know, a, a week and eight to twelve hours, I guess it was. And the longer she stayed, the more hours. And of course, she was always willing to either get up and open up, or stay late and lock up. <laughs> so. Do you hmm. have um, uh, much uh, relationship with your husband's family? I, yes, we do. Um, we, uh, every year, the Metaxans get together and and we have uh, our annual Thanksgiving at the Town of Hobart Town Hall. And in between times, um, we're, he's pretty close to his brothers. Mm -hmm. And um, so we go with them places and sometimes vacations. And, um, but when his mother and dad were alive, they and my mother would come down, like for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and uh, birthdays of the kids, or Gerald, or state fair, or something like that. And, and most of the time they stayed with Gerald and myself, and uh, with my mom, because we had a pretty big place. Um, and his aunts in Milwaukee. 
and then he had one uncle, Casper Metaxon. Uh, Gerald used to call him quite often when he was in the nursing home. And uh, he spends time going up to see his sister Lois, who's in the nursing home now. Um, he lost one sister, and he was real close to her. But uh, as far as his brother and sisters, we keep in contact pretty much. So. How many years did you live in Milwaukee? I moved there in June 1954. And you moved home when? March of this year. Of this year, of this year yeah. So. Is there anything else that you would like to let us know about your life? Well, nothing that's real exciting. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not that exciting a person, I don't think, but I do, I do like to help people. Um, in Milwaukee, we had a Indian elderly organization, Indian Council of the Elderly, it was called, and um, we used to go for lunches there, and uh, I would help them out with their white elephant sale, which they would have once a month. Um, Gerald and I, are, we tried to help other people who maybe need stuff. I'm not, we're not so much uh, like joining groups, but we patronize a lot of them. The Indian elderly, the uh, United Indians of Milwaukee, we attend a lot of stuff there. If uh, high school kids are having fundraisers, um, we donate a lot. Um, I guess we, we did try to join at one time, but it always seemed like every time we would go there, they would say their meetings are going to start at 7 or 6.30 or whatever, and I'd be sitting there till 8, 8.30, and <laughs> nobody would show up or... They wouldn't start because the only couple of people showed up. So I think it kind of took away from our, you know, wa wanting to join things. Mm -hmm. So we just sort of, after that, just go to different uh, fundraisers and doings that they have. But um, I did, I was the um, chairperson of SEATS when it first began. But because of uh, my not being able to get involved because of my working, I, I, re I resigned. Um, one of the people that um, also was on there was constantly coming up here and telling me I should do this or this was going on, that was going on. I could not make it during the day because I had a job. So I thought, well, if that's the case, then somebody else can do it because they can come up here. I can't, and I can't give uh, my time like that because I'm holding a job, and I can't take off just whenever whenever I want it, you know. But it's, um, I did, the last three years I worked, they did sort of, uh, I won't say cater, but they allowed me to take time off when I wanted to. They, I was going to retire three years ago, and they asked me to stay on so that um, they, because they couldn't train anybody, they couldn't hire anybody. And I said, well, I would stay provided I could take a vacation day or leave without pay for anything that was going on up here that I felt I needed to come home for. And so that was the agreement. So I really, they were really good to me that way.